Good morning, everyone. Ooh. A bit loud this morning. Continue on looking at uh, this series we've been looking at over a number of weeks now in the book of Job. And we get to the passage in chapter 38 where what happens or what Job has been both longing for and dreading takes place. It's not the first time God has spoken, but this is the time when God speaks with real power. So let's pray as we come to God's word together that he'll continue to speak with great power this morning. Father God, we thank you that you're the God who speaks. You speak in creation. You've spoken through the Lord Jesus. And you speak by your spirit. Take us and use us, our thoughts, our thinking, our minds, our living our experiences that we are currently going through. And Lord, minister to us, we pray, in the power of your Spirit, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good. God speaks. Chapter 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. And Elihu, over the past, we were looking at last week, number of chapters has been saying to Job about the God of creation, the God who's created, the God who cares, the God who speaks, the God who loves, the God who is just. And when God speaks, it is out of the storm. And he has been reminding Job of the wonder of the weather. And it's almost as if Job, uh, Elihu has spoken and God says, yeah, I'm ready to speak now. The silence of God is over. And Elihu has prepared Job's heart and his friend's heart and Elihu's heart to be in a place to be able to hear God speak. Now we might often wonder, why does God not speak more clearly? We were reminded by Elihu last week that God often speaks, but man can't hear him or chooses not to hear him. But in this passage that we have before us today, the Lord speaks out of the storm. He said, who is this, verse 2, that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. It's a conversation going on. Not a quiet, gentle conversation, but I think it is a loving conversation. And what staggers me, actually, in all that's been taking place over these past 38 chapters, 37 chapters, is that the three friends and Job and Elihu are still there talking. Some of them are silent, but they haven't walked away. They are still engaged in the conversation. There's still an opportunity, as we'll see in later verses, chapters, next couple of weeks' time, that God is going to speak and restore each of them. There is a time to speak, there is a time to be silent. But if we want to have good relationships, there's never a time to say, don't talk. Conversation's over. I'm not willing to discuss that anymore. Because there's no way that anything can take place to restore or to create, to take a stance that says, actually, I've got it sewn up. I don't want to hear any other opinion. I don't want to hear any other thoughts. It's to break relationship. And the God who is a God of relationship calls us to talk and to be in relationship with one another. Yes, God was silent. Not totally silent. Job couldn't hear him. But God is going to speak. And there's real value 
in being open to hearing what perhaps we do not want to hear. There is real value in connecting with people and at times saying people things that they don't want to hear, as well as us not responding to things we don't want to hear. Solomon talks about iron sharpening iron. And in this chapter that we've got before us, God's going to speak and he wants Job to reply. In fact, he doesn't give him an option. I'm going to question you and you're going to answer. There's no let out clause here, Job. There's no hiding behind a hardened heart. There's a, a job you're going, to leave. you're going to need to listen to me and you're going to speak. And boy, does God speak. Question after question comes pouring in the storm and in the voice of God. Where were you when the world was created, Job? Verse 4. Tell me if you understand. Now, there are very many clever people around, aren't there, who think that they understand the theory of evolution or the theory of creation. They come up with great ideas. But the reality is, it is only by faith we can understand and hold that the world was created by God. By faith, Hebrews reminds us, none of us were there. Some of us may look old enough to have been there, but you weren't. And none of us are wise enough to be able to understand how the wonder and the intricacies of the earth we live on and the cosmos in which we are placed is held together. There are still questions to be answered, even our wonderful technological age. So do you know, Job? And he moves on, not just to look and think about, actually, Job, do you understand what's going to happen? Have you got any control? You question me, but have you any control? Verses 12 and verse 31. Have you given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Verse 12, verse 31, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cause of Orion, looking at the planets around? And of course, Job probably is beginning to feel a little bit uh, quiet. And there is a time to be quiet, a time to listen, a time to reflect. And God goes on, look at the creative world, Job. Don't look at your suffering. Look at what I have done. There's joy in creation, verse 7. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, the wonder and the glory of that created order that we know and read about in Genesis 1 and 2. It was good. It was perfect. And creation rejoiced. There's a control in the world in which we live. Verse 11. I said, this is far you can come and no further. Here is where your proud waves halt. Talking about the sea and the land and the waves. There's an order in this world that's been created, Job. And Job, you talk about injustice, but actually... Even evil is limited by death, verse 17 of chapter 38. Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Let's face it, for each and every one of us, death is still a mystery. Where it strikes and where it doesn't strike, how it strikes. Job, do you understand this? You look at a world in which there's lots of evil and injustice. But actually that injustice and that evil is restrained. Because dictators die. Because the wicked do not last forever. 
So look, Job, at the creative world. Lift your eyes up and have a look around. Look at the dawn. Look at the dusk. It's controlled by God, verses 19 and 20. What is the way to the abode of life and light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their place? Do you know the place to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. You're an old man, Job. You're, you're a wise man. Surely you know where and how things happen. Every day, dawn and dusk. The skies in verses 22 to 30 and 34 to 41, which provide life-giving water, the way that they're stored, the way that they fall, the way that they happen. The planets in verse 31 to 33. Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or let out the bear with its club? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Well, Job, can you do it? Do you understand? You've got control over it? And then he moves on in having looked at the creative world to, to bring to Job's attention the animal kingdom in verses 38, chapter, chapter 38, verse 39, through to chapter 40 and verse 3. The land animals. The lioness. The mountain goat. The wild donkey. The wild ox. The ostrich. The horse and the hawk are all brought into this picture as to what's taking place and what God has created. Look around and see what's there, Job. And then in chapter 40, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God, answer him. So somebody during the week asked me a question. Is it right to question God and to express our frustration with him or to ask him why? And I think my answer to that is, yes, it is. God wants the conversation. He wants us to explore. He wants us to understand. He wants us to grapple with him, and he wants us to grapple with one another. Hopefully, not too physically. Yeah. Although you never know what's going to happen. will take place here at PBC. It's a great place to be. Because he is a God who communicates. He's created us as a people who communicate. I think he must have been delighted when he saw Job and his three friends and Elihu in the background discussing and talking. Now, there may be a degree of frustration in God's heart with the three young or three wise men, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. But at least they were talking. One of the great things I've been seeing, exploring perhaps over these number of years that we've been with you, is the way that people have begun to talk about God and about life together. That needs to continue on. That needs to be something grasped and grappled with. That's one of the key reasons why when we do our Lord's Supper, we try and encourage people to sit with people that perhaps they don't usually sit with. To be able to have conversations and to build community with those that perhaps, believe it or not, you can come in and worship together and leave without ever seeing or speaking to for years and years and years. That's why we want to encourage the discussions and conversations between those who are older and whose family have grown up with those whose family are still here. To be able to share and to communicate, to talk about what are your fears? Because your fears as an 80-year-old or a 90-year-old or a 60-year-old will be different from those who are 15, 10, or 25. But they'll have the same basis. And it may just be that in that conversation and communication together, you have something to share in the same way as Elihu shared with Job, the young benefiting the old. 
that community connecting together because conversation is vital for the people of God and for God to, to, to reflect the nature and character of God. We sung about that in terms of what God has done through creation. Creation is talked about as singing, as communicating and sharing. The fields clap their hands, or mountains clap their hands, the rivers, something or other. You know, there's a, an expressions that are used. So can I commend you next week, when you come, to sit somewhere and with somebody different from last month. To look around and think about, actually, who can I learn, who can I discuss, and who can I enjoy sharing the Lord's Supper with as we reflect on this whole thing about fear? Because one thing I can guarantee you, each of us has fear. And we can encourage and strengthen one another by engaging and communicating the Lord said to Job, yeah, it's a wonderful thing that the creator God, the sovereign Lord of all, the one who's created the heavens and the earth, speaks. And here as a church, we hold the scriptures highly. The word of God is our basis. But God speaks through lots of different ways. And through people. Elihu spoke to Job. God speaks to Job. We were up in South London yesterday at a memorial Thanksgiving service for a lady who served in Indonesia for 70, 80 years. She died out there. Uh, only met her once, I think, back in 1983. Uh, she was a, a wisp of a lady, and uh, there's a whisper went round the church we were in at that time. Dorothy Marks is coming. She's going to share a word. And this little, and then I was 20 odd, 25 perhaps, little lady gets to the front. And you think, What's she going to say? And out boomed the biggest, loudest, most strong voice you have ever heard. And what followed was a conviction uh, of the power of Scripture uh, and the authority of God and the ability for him to be effective in work and ministry. Probably lasted 10, 15 minutes. And the church was spellbound. And as a young guy, young man, just listening to that, God spoke to me in a sense of saying, there's something true here. I have no idea what she talked about, but God spoke through an individual. You know, you could be that individual next week who God uses to speak into the life of a young person which could make an impact that lasts for decades. God speaks. He speaks through creation. He speaks through the storm. He speaks through a young man like Elihu. He speaks through people. This is the God who creates and holds the world in his hands. How are your ears? The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who whom accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord. I'm so glad that that sentence is there. He didn't walk away. He engaged with the God who had created him. But he engaged as only the created can. Verse 4. I 
am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I'll say no more. There is a time to be silent. And Job recognizes it. So God has answered the question, who's in control? And Job has come to recognize it is God who is in control. In spite of all that he's experienced. And then God moves on and speaks again in verse 6 of chapter 40. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. So the storm is still going. And what does he say? He says it again, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Poor old Job. As if he hasn't suffered enough. Verse 8, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's, and can your voice thunder like this, like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor. Clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at every proud man and bring him low. Look at every proud man and humble him. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that you, your own right hand can save you. Wow. God takes a bit of a risk, doesn't he? If you can do all that, bro, Job, I'll admit I got it wrong. I'll admit you're right. I'll admit you're actually more powerful than I am. I think uh, some degree of sarcasm if we're allowed to call that for God. You want justice? You do it better than I do it. Try it. And then he picks up two great beasts. Whether they are mystical or whether they are real, we don't know. He calls it the behemoth and he calls it the leviathan. People have talked about, is that one of the dinosaurs? Is it one of the creatures like a crocodile? In a sense, it doesn't really matter. But he says, look at these mighty beasts that roam the earth, that cannot be tamed, and just ask yourself, can you do it? Even just one beast. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. And then he talks about that character and look at the way he lives. And then verse 24, can you capture him by the eyes or trap him and pierce his nose? Can you do that, Job? And then when you look at the Leviathan, can you pull him out of the water with a fish hook? And so it goes on and on and on describing this character that has, in verse 33 of chapter 41, nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. He looks down on all that are haughty. He is king over all that are proud. You want to question the way I run the world, Job? You've got to be willing to take some responsibility for running it yourself. And we'd love that, wouldn't we? Maybe. We love to sort things out and have the answers to everything until we suddenly realize, as perhaps those in authority over us in government recognize, that once you sort out one problem, you often create three or four more. Our century has seen more laws written in the last 15 years, I believe, than was ever written in the centuries of our legal history going forward, going backwards. Because the world is more complicated. And the more that we make, the more complicated it gets. And 
what Job is reminding, God is reminding Job about is actually, you question my justice. But what can you do about it? So these are really big questions, aren't there? And in a sense, God doesn't answer the questions we want him to answer. God never reveals to Job that there was a conversation that took place in the heavenly realms between himself and Satan. Job is never explained that there's a situation that's going on here which is far bigger than his life could ever comprehend. There is a battle going on in a sense between do men and women have the capacity to love God in spite of what takes place that is not good? Job never knows that. We do. Because we're given the prologue. God never turns around and says, this is the way things are working out. He points him to a world in which we have as human beings to recognize that we can only walk by faith, not by sight. We can only trust in the one who has revealed something of himself in creation and in his word, and of course for us, which Job didn't have, through Jesus himself. We can only make sense of our world and the injustice and the pain and the awfulness that many do experience when we recognize and see that there's a Savior who came and died on a Good Friday. That in the pain and the suffering of long-term experiences of grief, of ill health, that God can be present in his quietness as we celebrate the Easter Saturday. But there is too a God who is present and powerful who can bring about a radical transformation in every person's life that is the resurrection story. Can we make sense of it? Sort of, but not fully. And I think that's got to be the most exciting part of following God. And one of the most dangerous and wrong things that we can do is to create an environment in which we've got God sorted and we know how he's going to work. That's what Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad wanted to do. And then they had to twist Job's life experience to fit their pattern. And along comes this young man, Elihu, who sees something of the nature and character of God in the world that he's created, in what he's experienced of him, and says, Job, actually, you've accused God of being unkind. You've accused God of being unjust. You've got, accused God of being silent. But I know a God who is different from that. There's a God who does speak, and he speaks in suffering. There's a God who's just, who brings about his purposes rightly. And there's a God who is mysterious. As mysterious as the weather and out of that great storm, God speaks. Many of you will know that this is our, going to be our final year of ministry here. I don't know what I'm going to be doing when we leave towards the end of next, this year. And that scares me. So next week when we're looking at fear, it's one of my big fears. We feel it's where God is calling us to. And at the same time as my fear comes my excitement that actually God has a purpose for here and the church. And he has a purpose for us as a family. And in a sense, to operate and to go into the unknown is one of the most fearful and yet exciting experiences of being a Christian. Of putting ourselves in a place where God's going to have to open up doors. And some of you are facing similar things. Loved ones. 
who are really unwell. And God will be there. Some of us face the uncertainty of our children and the pain of that. And God will be there. Some know the reality of Divorce and adultery and the pain. God will be there. Because although there is a world of injustice that God allows, although there is a world that at times seems unfair, that God allows. Behind it all is a God who speaks, who's spoken through his Son, who's spoken through his Word, who has provided for us if we have ears to hear him. Something which drives out all fear. We have a God who is just, who will and has settled the battle with evil once and for all. Yes, on the cross, but one day to come when Jesus returns in glory. So when we pray that Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, we seek to do that with him. And when it gets painful... And when it feels as if God doesn't care, the book of Job gives for us a picture. Look outside. Lift your eyes from your personal situation. Look and see the God who has spoken. Take yourself out to the hills. Take yourself out to see the wonder of creation. And then bring your eyes back to the cross. The God who's spoken. And maybe there is a place in which we should remain silent. But we never stop the conversation with God. Because he never stops it with us. These are powerful, powerful passages of Scripture that we need to grasp and understand. And Job then has to respond Because God has spoken and he must speak. So what does he say? Well, he says, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Job knows and recognizes that God is sovereign and that God has his purposes that are being fulfilled. He also recognizes what he doesn't know. You know, that's really important for us as Christians, isn't it? There are bits and pieces, there's lots we don't know. Job says in verse 3, You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful. For me to know. I now know that the complexity of the world in which you have placed me is more than ever I can fully grasp or understand. And then Job moves on. He says, you said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. He says, my ears have heard 
of you. The one thing that Elihu had told Job about was that God does speak, but men often don't hear. Job says, I've heard you speak. But even more importantly, he moves on, but now my eyes have seen you. So it's as if his understanding has been lifted to comprehend, and as his gaze not at the awfulness of the life which he is still experiencing, he's still on his pile of ash, he's still scraping himself with a bit of pottery because he's got boils all over himself, his children are still dead, he's still despised by the people around him but he's lifted his eyes from that to look to the God who he has been questioning and my eyes have seen you and his response therefore I now despise myself and repent in dust and ashes that sounds a little bit as if he's given up, but he hasn't. This is simply Job recognizing the wonderful, powerful, loving creator God who speaks. And Job says, yes, I've misrepresented you. I've accused you of being unjust. I've accused you of being silent. I've accused you of not caring. And I'm sorry. I don't think there'll be anybody here, myself included, who has not questioned God, not misrepresented him. Because we're human. But God still loves us. He still speaks. He doesn't throw a tantrum at Job. He doesn't throw a tantrum at, at uh, Eliphaz, at Zophar, or Bildad. He hangs in there because he loves us. We've almost got to the end of Job. God's spoken. And I trust that for each one of us there will be a renewed commitment to hearing God and a renewed commitment to looking and seeing Him. Corporately as a church as we face this future, individually as we look at the challenges that God has brought into each and every one of our lives. The things that he has allowed because he loves and he longs for us to turn to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're the God who speaks. Help us to be like Job, to be able to say, my ears have had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Lord, help us to grasp your truly loving, wonderful, powerful, sovereign purposes for us as individuals, for us as a church, and for this world that you are going to one day restore and bring to everlasting peace when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there will be new heavens and a new earth. Lord, keep us faithful until you come. For Jesus' sake. Amen.